Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord God, and um, Lord, your word that sets us free, your word that washes our minds and teaches us about who you are and who we are, God. Father, we thank you for your word, God, that is alive and full of power, that is sharper than a two-edged sword, Father God, and it's going to cut and divide and show us, reveal to us the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. Lord God, we ask that you would lay open our hearts this morning as we hear your word, Father, that you would just lay open our hearts, God, and reveal to us what is going on on the inside of us, Father. Help us to take, take a deeper look, Father. Help us to look closely, Father, to be introspective, Father, to see what is going on on the inside, God, that is dictating what's going on on the outside of our lives, Father. We thank you for your word, Father, and we embrace your word, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, okay, let's start um, in Proverbs chapter 23. And I'm just going to recap a little bit from last Sunday what I've preached, that our minds are always full of something. There's always something going on inside of our minds. It's never going to stop until we're on you know, life support or we're no longer here. Our brains are always working. And... God wants us to go in a certain direction in life. He has a destiny for each of our lives. And if we aren't thinking in line with his word and what he has for us, then we can't go in that direction of the destiny that he has. So we've got to set our minds straight in order to go down that path that he wants us to go down. We've got to set our minds to go in that direction. Our thoughts will dictate our feelings, our behaviors, our attitudes. <clears throat> so today we're going to take a little time to think about our lives and what's going on inside of our minds that is causing what's going on on the outside of our lives between us and other people, our relationships, our interactions, our reactions to things we hear, what we're dwelling upon, and our attitudes. What, what is my attitude towards different things? Or why do I have a bad attitude about this or about that? And we're going to, hmm, somebody has an attitude, I won't say it, but I see a smile. <laughs> um, so we have the ability to choose what our minds are filled with. And we all know that, obviously. That's just a given. But unless you actually think about that, that you have the ability to choose what is going on in your mind, you won't probably choose on purpose what's going on in your mind. I mean, there are people out there who... You know, they go out and they buy, like, a success tape or, you know, video or a CD, whatever, and they pop it in their cars, they go to work, and they're listening to this thing about success, and they're maybe repeating what the guy is saying on there. I am successful. I like myself, and I have a future, and, you know, I can do things. I'm strong. And, and have you ever listened to one of those? I have. They're great. I mean, it's really nice. It's very rote. It's very prepared. But... If you don't do something like that, then you're probably not choosing the thoughts that you're thinking. You're just, we're just thinking. We're just driving to work and we're just thinking whatever's coming into our minds. You know, oh, I've got to make dinner tonight and, oh, I've got this project at work today and I've got to confront that person and, you know, I've got to drive there and I've got to do this. And all these things are just flooding into our heads and we're not making a choice. This looks like up front here. I'm going to have to be front row sitters. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we're not consciously making choices about the thoughts in our minds. We're just taking whatever comes, whatever flies in. So maybe we are thinking about what we need to do, which is a conscious choice. But there are other thoughts that are just flying in that we should not be dwelling upon, that we should not be focusing on. Negative thoughts, thoughts of offense. I just had an offense this week that... It just kept going around and around and around in my mind and, and building and building. And so every time I got around that person, I was kind of, you know, quiet and, and reserved and not wanting to talk to them, not wanting to respond because I had this offense that was just growing and growing. And, of course, studying this subject is forcing me right up here, lady, and you can move those over if you want. Um, Studying this subject was forcing me to think about what I was thinking about. And so I got thinking about it, and I realized, oh my goodness, I am not taking my thoughts captive. I am not grabbing a hold of my thoughts. Instead, my thoughts are just running away like a freight train, ready to crash because it was going to cause problems and frictions in the relationship with that person who I had the offense with. So if I didn't take those thoughts captive, 
captive, if I didn't actively grab a hold of those thoughts and stop them, then they were going to destroy the relationship, if not just temporarily, until the issue, you know, came out, which is frequently what happens. You know, what's wrong? Nothing. Oh, what's, do you have something wrong today? Are you okay today? I'm fine, right? That's typically how, why do we do that? And that's another subject, because we don't want confrontation. We don't like confrontation. We don't want to deal with things. We just rather keep the peace. But is it really keeping the peace? No, because you have no peace inside of you. Maybe the other person has peace. I just found out um, like four days ago maybe that during our cross-country season while I was coaching, I offended this one girl. And I asked her about her shirt size, and we were looking for a large, and she is kind of large, and I thought maybe she had the large, and apparently she didn't. She had a medium, but I asked her a couple times, and it embarrassed her. Well, she held that offense the entire season. The mother held the offense the entire season. And when the season was over, finally the head coach told me that this happened, and I asked, when did this occur? And I found out from the mother it happened, like, two weeks into the season. They held that offense the entire time. They, they went to the head coach and told him because that was, would not be confrontation. Coming to me would have been confrontation. But I would have apologized, so it really wouldn't have been confrontation. You know, it would have been gentle. But, you know, they were afraid it wouldn't be. So, <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves, in what state is our mind? Ask yourself right now, silently. Don't have to say it out loud. In what state is my mind? Even just looking at this past week, where has my mind been? Have I been mulling over past offenses? <clears throat> Have I been thinking about maybe regrets? Things I didn't do, things I did wrong, things that, you know, mistakes that I made. Have I been thinking about, you know, maybe my self-worth and how I'm, I'm so awful and I'm so unworthy and I'm just no good? Have I been worrying about finances? Has there been fear and anxiety going through me, just circulating through me and just staying there, bombarding me, weakening me? Where have I been this week? <clears throat> so just hold those thoughts. And it should be in Proverbs chapter 23. Although I have the NIV in front of me and it does not say what the scripture says I have on my paper. I don't know what version this is I have on my paper, but maybe it's the New King James. And it may be just half the scripture. But it's, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We've all heard this scripture before. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So am I. As I think in my heart, so goes my life. So is my life. So, is, so are my surroundings. So are my relationships. As I think in my heart, whatever's circulating and mulling around in my mind, and we're calling it the heart here, spirit and soul together, whatever is going on inside of me is producing what is on the outside of me. So if I have broken relationships, if I have strife, if I have anxiety, if I, if I have poverty surrounding me, in any sense, financial or um, friendship-wise or what, whatever, it's because of what's going on on the inside of me. As a man thinks in his heart, as a woman thinks in her heart, as a girl or a boy think in their hearts, that is what is going to be manifested on the outside in your life. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So do you know what you need to change? Can you identify? Can you look at the relationships around you or the situations you're in and identify what you need to change? Is there tension in your relationships? Do you need to start thinking differently about those people? Do you need to be quicker to forgive? As soon as there's an offense, quick to forgive, quick to lay it aside, quick to, to realize you know what? They don't know what they're doing. They're making a mistake. They're, they're being themselves. They're not changing, perhaps. But do I have control over that? No. I can't change them. I can only change me. I can pray for them, and God can change them, but I cannot change them. 
So we need to be looking at our surroundings and asking ourselves, what can I do about this? If there's something I can do, do it. If there's nothing, then I need to pray and let God do it. Let God do the changing. I was just doing that this week with that person I had the offense with, praying, you know what, God, you made this person, you created this person, you love this person, and so, God, I pray that you would change this person so that they would not be so self-centered and think about other people. And, and I had to get a hold of myself, though, because at first, it was just tension, and it was, you know, it was strife, and it was negativity, and it was just this uh, sandpaper against sandpaper rubbing. It wasn't, it wasn't working. And that's how I was for a couple decades of my life, of getting these thoughts and just mulling over them, just keeping them and meditating on them. And then they were affecting everything around me because they would affect my mood. Whatever was in my heart and mind was affecting my mood. And that would affect the people around me. <clears throat> so let's turn, we're still in Proverbs, to chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4. So if there's lots of strife and stress, and there's friction and tension, you have power in your hands to change that. That does not have to be. It does not have to exist. You have power. Whatever it was in your grasp to deal with, you can deal with. But the possibility exists that you are not dealing with it. The possibility exists that you're just going about your business, doing your thing, and you're not actually actively dealing with your thoughts that are causing your moods and attitudes and behaviors. You might not even realize what kind of attitudes you have. My husband always used to tell me I had certain looks <laughs> that I could give. <laughs> well, I'm not looking in the mirror all the time. I don't know what looks I have. I don't know. I mean, my kids would know. They could tell you. I remember saying just a few months ago, you know, I realized... I'm 42. I realize now, for the first time ever, I'm kind of obsessive. And they were like, oh, really? <laughs> Mom, you're just figuring this out, huh? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Revelation! <laughs> they've known it for my entire life, since they've known me, <laughs> that I can be obsessive and kind of get a hold of something and not let it go. And then I, you know, drive it and drive it and drive it and make everything as good as I can, and, you know, that's just how I am. But I didn't know I was that way. I did not, I couldn't see myself to know I was that, isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a really dominant trait in my life <laughs> that I could not see. So you might need to ask the people around you. If you're married, your spouse will tell you. <laughs> if they're not afraid of you, <laughs> he or she will tell you your, the attitudes that you have. Your best friend, your parents, your family members will tell you, yep, this is what I see in your life, and they'll probably be glad that you're asking. Are you sure you want to know? <laughs> no, she says no. I'm not too sure I want to hear that. <laughs> okay, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. <clears throat> Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And then the Amplified says, keep and guard your heart with all vigilance. And above all that you guard, guard your heart. For out of it flows the springs of life. So there's this place in my life called my heart where things flow out. <laughs> things, things in life are flowing out of my heart. And God is saying, above all else, I need to guard it. I need to keep watch. You want to and yeah, I am um, reviewing, this is a repeat, but it's because we can hear a scripture once, and it's just, Zhoo, oh, that's cool, Zhoo, and it's gone. We need to hear it again and again and again. So, to guard means to watch over in order to protect or control. So I need to guard my heart. I need to watch over and guard my soul, my mind, my thoughts. I need to watch and keep guard. Above all else. I mean, he says, above all else that you're going to guard, above everything else you're going to watch, you need to guard your heart. What is going on on the inside of me? I need to keep guard. And it, and it, it implies that you need to do it. He's not saying God's going to guard your heart. God's going to watch over it. Oh, God's in control of everything. He is sovereign, but he's not going to guard your heart for you. 
It's your job to guard your heart. It's your God job to watch over and keep your soul intact and healthy and clean. So that's why I say we need to ask ourselves, what is going on inside our mind? What, what thoughts are flooding through? And, and if I'm getting upset with people around me, then I need to look at the thoughts that are in my heart. Even brothers and sisters, if you're fighting, if you're not getting along, you can start at this age. Asking, my, asking yourself, what is going on inside my heart? Why do I get upset? Why do I get upset when somebody does this or that? Ask yourself why. This is something I did years ago. I started asking myself why I would get angry um, when I would come home with a car full of groceries and my husband did, wasn't <clears throat> waiting at the window looking for me. <laughs> oh, here she comes! And run out and help me carry in all the groceries. I would feel so upset that I had haul them all in. And, you know, he's just in there sitting at the kitchen table, you know, do, typing or doing some work or whatever. And he's not just there to help me. And I would get so upset. And I had to go to God and say, God, why not blame him? Because we like to blame shit. We like to blame other people. And that's been my favorite thing in life to do. My favorite hobby has been to blame everybody else, especially my husband, for the things that are going on inside my heart. And I think that's satanic. I think that is... Um, the tempter, the deceiver, I think that is the devil working in our minds to cause us to want to blame everybody else so we aren't looking at ourselves. And so I had to go to God and say, why is this? Why, why, why do I get so upset? And he would show me, if I would get in a time of prayer where I was really focused on God, he would show me a time in my life when something occurred where somebody, you know, abandoned me or something. They weren't, they weren't there to help me, and I was all on my own, and I had to struggle, and, and it created a stronghold in my life. It created this place where now I filtered everything that happened through that time in my life, through that stronghold, and he would show me what to do. I would go to the Father, and I would forgive that person, or I would have to repent of something, or... You know, do something that God wanted me to do to make it right, and he would begin healing my heart in that area. And then I would come home, and I could just, like you're supposed to, walk in the door with one bag and say, Hey, honey, I'm home. Could you help me carry in the groceries? Right. Sure, I'll help you. you know, and do it the right way. Instead of expecting this thing, expecting this person to do these things that they don't even know I want them to do, and they, even if they knew it, they didn't know I was home to you know, we have these expectations of people, and it has to do with renewing our minds because these are the thoughts that are circulating within my head. This is causing the tension in my marriage. This is causing the tension at work because I've got these thoughts going on, and I'm not just talking to the person about it or going to Jesus about it. I am letting it make me angry. And people don't have the ability to make us angry. We choose to get angry. We choose to allow ourselves to be offended. We choose to let it happen. So it's our choice then to deal with it, to cut that off and just confront it and deal with it. <clears throat> so, keep and guard your heart with all vigilance. Vigilance means to keep careful watch for possible danger or difficulty. Keep and guard your heart because there are possibly dangers and difficulties that are going to enter into your heart and mess up your life. Dangers and difficulties are going to come in. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance for out of it flow the springs of life. So God is saying here, there are things that can come out of a healthy heart that can cause life in your life in your relationships, in your interactions, in your work, in your prosperity, in your future. There are things in your heart that can cause life all around you. But we've got to have those things in our hearts, first of all, put in there with God's word, planting the seed of the word in our heart. And secondly, coming out of our mouth, sowing those seeds, watering the seeds then in our heart that we've sown. That's, if it's in our heart, 
then it's going to flow out in some form. It can flow out through actions, just through doing good to the people around us, and it can flow out through the form of words. Speaking God's word over situations. If that wellspring of life will flow out of my heart through my mouth, then I can water everything in my life, and good things can grow. Instead of stress and strife and tension and frustration and anger and divorce and broken relationships and poverty and just problems. Anger. Fear. Okay, let's move on now to 2 Corinthians. New Testament. <clears throat> Going to the right. 2 Corinthians. 2 <coughs> Corinthians chapter 10. For though we live in the world, we, uh, sorry, chapter, verse 3, verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So again, as I talked about last Sunday, we are in a war. We've all heard this verse before, right? We've, we've probably all heard it before. But do we live on a daily or weekly basis reminding ourselves that I am in a war? I'm in a war. I, I don't. I forget. So I assume you forget too. I forget that I'm in a war. I forget there's a battle for my soul. That there's a fight going on in the spirit realm for my mind. Because wherever my mind goes, that's where my life is going to go. And if Satan can defeat the body of Christ, he will defeat us through our minds going in the wrong directions, causing relationships to die causing us to not live like Christians, causing us to walk by opportunities to bless somebody who really needs it, who would maybe come into the kingdom of God because of the blessing that we would give or do, perform, but because my mind isn't there because I'm kind of rushing, I'm angry and I'm frustrated, I'm just going to walk by that person who I could help. We're in a war. We need to remind ourselves constantly that we are in a war, but we don't Fight the way the world fights. How does the world fight in a war? Or just even the daily life war? Arguing? Tongue. The tongue, okay. Lashing out with your tongue. Blaming. Blaming. Getting worse. Okay, and it's always getting worse. Violence. We get into actual wars. Violence. Uh huh. Okay, so just stepping on the little guy to get yourself up higher. Okay, so the world is fighting a war that is against other people. They're always fighting with other people. Everyone is fighting against each other. So the war that we are in is never going to have anything to do with fighting with other people. It will never, if it comes down to God, is this right or wrong? I'm fighting with this person. That is a war. We will never be fighting with other people. We will always be going to the word and using the word. So the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So in this war, we have weapons. Now in a natural war, we have guns. They used to have bayonets. I don't know if they still have bayonets these days. They have tanks. They've got bullets. They've got physical things to fight with. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. Our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. So what is a stronghold? Here's a definition. A place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. A place that has been fortified. Cereal is fortified with vitamins. It's made healthier, stronger, better. A place that's been fortified. So there are places in our minds, in our hearts, that have been taken over by the enemy. Strongholds. Places in our minds that have been taken over by the enemy, and they're now his. And so we take them back. He has taken up residence in our minds in certain places. <clears throat> Does he belong in our minds? <laughs> no. No. He doesn't belong there. But yet he's taken up residence in our minds. He has taken over. He has won a battle. He's taken the hill, and the hill is now his. 
And whatever that place is in your mind, I was thinking this week, um, my daughter Rachel brought to my attention a stronghold that I had from my childhood. And that was, in my childhood, my brother, who's two years older than me, or a year and a half, was always struggling. He'd get manic depression, and he was on medication, he had all these allergies, and our parents were divorced when we were little. And he was then later in life seeing a psychologist, and it was just rough. And I'd like to say I got through it unscathed. I know I didn't. I know I came through with lots of strongholds, but I wasn't, like, tormented like he was. I, d I just wasn't struggling as deeply as he was. So I always looked at girls as being stronger and boys as being weaker. Like, boys need more protection, they need more coddling, they need more nurturing, they need more mothering, they need just to be taken care of, and I mean, we'd be in the car on a trip, and my brother would lay down on my lap, I was like a mother to him, I just, you know, going back and forth, broken families, it's just how it is, <laughs> and so I grew up with this belief, it's an ungodly belief that in a few weeks you'll be talking about on a Thursday night, right, it's, it was an ungodly belief. Ungodly because it didn't agree with God's word. Boys and girls are the same, and everyone can be strong in Christ. You can be strong if you're in Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're male or if you're female. That I had this stronghold that I filtered my mothering through. And I would treat my son differently than my daughters because I felt that girls were strong. Girls could handle public school, you know? <laughs> Boys, on the other hand, maybe can't handle public school so well because they need to be protected more. Girls are tough, you know? There, they, Rachel at 14 could go to Australia for a month, sure. <laughs> she, she did, and because she's, she's a girl. She's strong, she's tough, she can handle it. And, you know, she can get through anything. But boys, on the other hand, not so much because they need to be protected. That is not true. It's not the truth. It's just a perception I had from my childhood that I developed that I didn't even, well, I knew I, knew I had it, but I didn't realize it was affecting my family. <laughs> didn't realize it was affecting today. But it was a belief. It was like a hill that Satan had taken, and he was in charge of it, and, and everything was being filtered. Now that could, I don't, hopefully it didn't mess up my kids. It made my girls stronger, maybe. <laughs> and hopefully not my boy weaker. <laughs> Um, it wasn't too devastating, but yet it's, it's a fallacy. It is a falsehood. It is something, I don't want to believe something false. I want to believe the truth. So, 